Hi and welcome back. My name is Rosica and this is The Midnight Reader. I apologize a bit. I apologize a bit because it's been at least three weeks since my last video and all I have to say is that this is something that no one pays me to do and that I do it for fun and it's spring going into summer and I'm gonna have an erratic upload schedule during the summer because I'm having a bit of a life and it's kind of great. <laughs> um, I'm still reading a lot. I still try to watch booktube. I do have this video and then two other videos which should be uploaded once a week, at least for the next uh, three weeks. So there will be some semblance of normalcy. But yeah, it may be a, a bit of an erratic upload schedule just until I can kind of find my groove. I've been busy. I've had family visiting. Um, I've started rock climbing again. I'm gardening on my little balcony, which has been super fun. I've started my training for a half marathon and I'm having a bit of a life. So I thought I'd take the time to sit down and do a spring wrap up. So this would be all the books I read in April and May since we're just at the end of May, as I'm filming this, I read nine books, which was pretty good for me. I aim for like four to five books a month right now, um, so I'm right on track for reading at least 60 books this year. There were some bangers, and there were some not bangers <laughs> And hopefully uh, you'll see, based on my reading list, what an eclectic fool I am. <laughs> So first I read A Bright Woman Wanted by Sarah Gailey. It's a great little western fiction sci-fi. It features a cast of queer characters who uh, become librarians and the librarians in this book are essentially rebels against their oppressors. I thought it was really cute. There was a little bit of romance in it. Um, it was the first time I'd read a book where a main character uses they them pronouns which in the beginning I thought was going to be really confusing, but turns out it's not. It's not confusing at all, and it was fine. You can be gender neutral in a book, and it is completely not confusing at all. <laughs> I got this book through Tor.com. They offer free ebooks every like month or so if you sign up for their no newsletter. It's all free, and it's one of the ways I get free books that are otherwise not available at my local library. I am sticking to four stars because even though I thought it was really original and a fun little western sci-fi dystopia, I didn't realize it was a novella when I picked it up. And when I finished it, all I was wishing for was that it had been a longer book because the ending didn't feel super earned. And I just, I just wanted, I wanted more nuance. For example, I read the book and I can't really tell you who the villain was. I think, I think the villain was patriarchy and censorship. So maybe a little more like villain development would have been nice. There were some great action scenes. Um, very enjoyable little read. I would 100% be in support of making this a 10 episode Netflix series. I think it would be great on TV. Um, as a book, it was just a little undercooked. Next, I read The Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood. I did do an in-depth um, review on this book, as well as interviewing my PhD husband about it, uh, and I'll link that video here. So I'm not going to go into it in great detail. It's essentially a romance between a PhD candidate student named Olive Smith and a professor named Adam Carlson. It has very many romance tropes, including grumpy sunshine and fake dating. The writer initially started this as Raylo fanfic and then made it into a full book where it's very much something else. It's just a romance set in STEM academia. There are some major problematic issues with it, at least in uh, the US academic setting, where some of the aspects of their relationship would just not happen or would be pretty frowned upon slash inappropriate, as well as way too much PDA that just would make all your coworkers uncomfortable. <laughs> However, I did really wind up enjoying it. It was such a little snack to read. It's It's kind of slow until you get into a couple of very steamy chapters where it just turns essentially into like literatica. <laughs> so if that's not your thing, maybe steer clear of the book. It was fun and I'll probably be reading other stuff by Ali Hazelwood when I'm in the mood for it. Four stars. Next, I finally finished A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, which was my classics in a cup draw for the month of March and April. So I pulled a classic out of a cup uh, at random and it was A Tale of Two Cities. And I'm pretty sure I cried a little bit <laughs> because woof, woof, 
Charlie, that was a lot, my dude. Charlie, it was a lot. <laughs> so here's what happened. Last Christmas, I read A Christmas Carol, which was my first Charles Dickens, and I loved it. It was so readable. It was so funny. Chef's kiss. And I kept seeing The Tale of Two Cities floating around on the book tubes with some cool and trendy people reading it. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, that doesn't look so thick. Maybe, maybe I could read it and, and be literary and cool. And it turns out that that is the motherfucking abridged copy, which was not available at my library, which I did not know until I had picked the book. The only one that was available at my library was the 16 hour audiobook of the unabridged version, <laughs> which I started listening to on my commute to work, from work, like I was stuck in some sort of circuitous Dickensian punishment device. <laughs> I also knew nothing. Here is what I thought the book was about. I thought A Tale of Two Cities was a tale about wealth inequality. So I thought it was about a tale of rich London and poor London from two different characters' perspectives. I thought it was a metaphor. <laughs> Guess what? It's about two actual cities. <laughs> it's about London and Paris. Two actual cities. It was not a metaphor. <laughs> that does make sense in retrospect, I will say. They did literally tell me what it was about. <laughs> it follows a family and characters who are sort of intertwined by circumstances during the build-up and explosion of the French Revolution. And I was lost, guys. I was lost in France. I didn't know we were gonna be in France, and then we were fucking in France. <laughs> I still love his writing. I love, particularly, he would have sort of descriptors towards the beginnings of, like, chapters, particularly the ones on poverty and the brutality of the mob. I thought were really poetic and lovely. I still really adore his writing. The problem was, is that it was really fucking confusing. He plays with a lot of themes about duality, so there's like a lot of twins. There's a lot of people who share names. There's a lot of people who look similar in the book, and that makes major plot things happen. Um, there's time jumps, so it's confusing. It's confusing. And like, I just had no idea what was happening. At one point, he was talking about a scene where there were five people in a room all named Jacques. Jacques 1, Jacques 2, Jacques 3, Jacques 4, Jacques 5. And I had no idea what was happening. It was too many Jacques. <laughs> so I panicked because what was happening was I would read a chapter and I would have no idea what it was about. If I had a pop quiz and my life depended on it, I couldn't tell you what happened in the chapter. So I panicked and visited a website I have not been to since I was in high school, which was Clip Notes. <laughs> and let me tell you, that was one of the best choices of my entire life. So basically, I would read a chapter and then I would go to Clip Notes and I would read the chapter summary. And that helped me synthesize the information. I did that for about the first two thirds of the book. And then after that, I knew the characters well enough that I didn't really need it anymore. Um, it also had lots of helpful insights, like the fact that there were five people in a room named Jacques was because they were spies and Jacques was the code name for the Jacquerie, who were spies and rebels in the French Revolution, which I didn't know because I, I had an American education. <laughs> it was an interesting story. It has some of the most memorable lines in literature, including the opening and closing lines of the book. I'm not going to go into it in too much more detail. I'm probably going to make a separate video just to kind of add it to my Classics in a Cup playlist. Without Cliff Notes, it's two stars. It was an impenetrable wall of Dickensian language. With Cliff Notes, it was four stars. It was not the best classic I've ever read. It was not the easiest classic to read. And dear God, did it go on. Next, I read three books for my video, Becoming Ariel Bissette, where I picked three books which were recommended by my favorite booktuber and podcaster, Ariel Bissette. The books I chose were How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating by Elizabeth Tova Bailey, and Animal Farm by George Orwell. I went into those books in more detail in that video. To go quickly into them, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy is a nonfiction book by an art professor who talks about what our attention is and how to resist the hijacking of it by our social media and sort of clicking culture. Despite having how to do in the title, it's not really a self-help book, nor does it really tell you how to do that. It simply just goes into like kind of a philosophical investigation 
on what attention is. The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating is probably one of my favorite books I've read this year. It's a nonfiction book about a woman who in her early 20s becomes ill with an unknown disease that leaves her sort of horizontally bed bound. Um, her friend brings her a snail and she becomes, with not much else to do, sort of engrossed in this world of this tiny creature next to her bed, uh, including the fact that you can hear a wild snail eating. Uh, she described it as uh, making tiny celery-like crunches. It's the sort of nonfiction I enjoy, which kind of delves into just kind of slowing down and paying very close attention to one little thing. Animal Farm by George Orwell is a well-known classic that I read when I was about 13, 12, 13 years old in junior high. It was required reading and I hated it. Um, and it turns out if you revisit a classic when you're an adult and you have a better understanding of complex world geopolitics and the Russian Revolution, you might enjoy it a little better. I thought it was a very easy to read classic. It's pretty short. Um, there's not a wasted sentence in the book. It's excellent. It gets his point across and it has lots of characters representing anything from the bourgeoisie to Stalin, Lenin, and Karl Marx. I thought it was great. Uh, so I, I gave How to Do Nothing four stars. I gave The Sound of Wild Snail Eating five stars, and I gave Animal Farm five stars. I did also choose to count Animal Farm as my classics poll for the months of May and June, because to be totally honest with you, I read a bunch of fairly thick classics, and I'm using the opportunity to take a break. Uh, I am counting May and June as being read. <laughs> Next uh, is one of the books that is probably going to be in the running for one of my favorite books of 2022, which is A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. Um, I had seen the cover kind of going around and uh, people saying they were interested in reading it. I think the cover is lovely. I would describe it as like a cozy sci-fi in a non-dystopia future. It follows the story of Dex, who is a non-binary tea monk, um, who sort of becomes disenchanted and burned out from the world and sort of has a retreat into the wilderness where they run into a wild robot named Boss Cap. Um, and that's probably not describing it very well. I love this book. I also got it for free through like a tour.com free book of the month thing and I was just so <laughs> engrossed in it. It's a sort of quiet little masterpiece and I all I can say is I just kept picturing it like it was a Miyazaki movie because that's how it felt to me. If you like movies like Howl's Moving Castle and Nausicaa by Miyazaki, this kind of slots right into those sort of futures of the intersection between like sci-fi and nature and sort of the quiet joys of life and quiet sadnesses of life. Not a lot happens in this book, but I gotta tell you, I absolutely loved it. It is apparently going to be a series with another book I think released later this year, which I am very excited to read. And I will probably be reading a lot more by Becky Chambers. This was the second book <laughs> in a month and ever that I had read with a non-gender uh, conforming main character. And again, it wasn't confusing at all. I loved it. <laughs> um, actually too, because uh, Moss Cap is also gender neutral because they are a robot. But I just thought it was lovely and wonderful and I don't know how to describe it better other than it made me feel happy and calm like a cup of tea on a rainy day. Five stars. Next was Book Lovers by Emily Henry. I am a huge fan of Emily Henry, although my favorite book hands down was Beach Read. A lot of the other books I read have been good but not my favorite like Beach Read was. It is a romance, a bibliophile romance. It sort of plays with characters who would be sort of baddies in other rom-coms. The main character whose boyfriends keep leaving and going on vacations and finding themselves in small towns and falling in love with like the dairy farmer's daughter. So she's like the big city woman who like can't get over her job and her life and all, all those men leave in order to pursue their own rom-com realities. It gave me a little bit of like Sandra Bullock and the proposal vibes. I, I thought it was pretty good. I, I wound up giving it four stars instead of three mainly because it restarted my uh, reading journey in a different series. 
because the male main interest is very much a sort of like dark kind of character, misunderstood, heart of gold, um, but kind of outwardly seen as an ass. I gave it four stars mostly because it got me restarted into reading this series. So I read A Court of Mist and Fury, A Court of Wings and Ruin, and A Court of Silver Flames all in a month because nothing says Dark Prince with a heart of gold like Rise End in Akatar. So I initially read the first book, thought it was like such a snack, easy kind of reading. These are all like romances with very horny fairies in them. <laughs> Initially I really liked the first book and then I moved on to A Court of Mist and Fury and I got about halfway through it and then I put it down for like three or four months and I didn't touch it again because it essentially reverses the entire plot and kind of characters in the first book. So everyone who we were supposed to fall in love with and think was great is now the villain. Everyone who is villainous is now sort of redeemed. And I just kind of was pissed at it, I guess, because uh, I didn't particularly like the villain in the first book. I thought he was kind of douche uh, and not a particularly healthy uh, love interest. But then he's the love interest in this book and you're supposed to really you know, root for him, and I was not rooting for him 300 pages into the book. These are not small books. These are, these are hefty truckers. And if it takes me like 800 pages to get to a redeemable character arc, I might not get there. <laughs> a Court of Mist and Fury was probably my favorite of the three that I read. I really like how they wound up redeeming the villain character, even if he is wildly problematic. A Court of Wings and Ruin, I like the battle scenes. The battle scenes were cool, but it takes a while to get there. A Court of Silver Flames, which is probably where I'm gonna, I'm gonna end my Sarah J Mass journey. And in all honesty, maybe I will read the next book that she puts out. Basically in this one, it takes the perspective of, of a side character and all the characters we've sort of grown to love as like family and friends in the first three books she from her perspective finds them pretty like spiteful and annoying and well i did too after a while <laughs> which meant that by the end of the book i didn't like any of the characters anymore <laughs> the last book focuses on uh nastia who's the sister of the main character and her love interest and i'm just gonna say that nastia she is nasty. <laughs> the first 300 pages were just like hardcore constant like sex scenes and it was just it was a bit much and let me tell you sometimes I listen to these books on audiobook which means that I can't walk outside because I'm walking by small children and people having you know minding their business and things come on on my ears and I just, I can't turn the volume down low enough, if you know what I mean. So if you took the bones of A Court of Silver Flames out of this book, I thought it probably had the most interesting character arc, kind of, but she didn't really nail a finish in my opinion and it wasn't really worth it in my opinion. And also I'm starting to think that all the male characters are exactly the same. I'm a little bit agitated out and I don't think I'm gonna read the A Court of Frost and Starlight because to be honest even though it is what I finally wanted which is a really short book uh, I don't think that anything interesting is gonna happen in there because I skipped reading it and I don't think I missed any character development or major plot points. Looking at my Goodreads I guess I gave a Court of Mist and Fury, four stars, A Court of Wings and Ruin, four stars, and then A Court of Silver Flames, three stars. I enjoyed it, but, and I feel like I can't say it any other way. I enjoyed it, but <laughs> I think I prefer romance with less annoying characters. But I will say, if you like Ryzend in A Court of Mist and Fury and A Court of Wings and Ruin, I bet you'll like book lovers because Dark Prince with a redeemable heart of gold and outwardly an ass, that's kind of the trope. Last, I read Ariadne by Jennifer Saint because I've been really trying to get a bunch of books that have been sitting on my CBR shelf 
read and that is going to be a big goal for me this summer is to read a lot of the books that I already have that are sitting on the TBR shelf. Let's see, where is it? See, it's not on the shelf anymore. This is a Greek mythological retelling about Ariadne. I think a, da a daughter of Helios? Granddaughter of Helios. She's related to the sun titan just like Circe. <laughs> I love a good Greek mythological retelling. Circe was one of my favorite books um, last year. I just really thought I was gonna love this and I kind of did. I kind of did. So Ariadne you would probably know from Greek mythology for being the sister of the Minotaur who Theseus gets help from to go and slay. So it follows the story of actually Ari Ariadne and her younger sister and their lives as they kind of grow up into adults and how they intersect. Um, one marries a hero, one marries a god. While this is a retelling, it sticks pretty close to the original mess, which means that women don't do great because women never did great in Greek myths and the author goes into pretty good pains to describe why that is and why women in Grecian myths just kind of exist to be punished or favored for deeds of men and it's inherently problematic because Greek myths were written and told by men. <laughs> I appreciated that the narration for the book came from two females, it came from the two sisters points of views, however it ends depressingly badly for both sisters as it did in the original miss so well it gave them a voice it didn't give them any agency so i just it was kind of depressing and i didn't enjoy it as much as i thought it would i would give it like thoroughly three and a half four stars it was okay it's it's not gonna wind up on the favorite shelf but if you like greek myths it's you can definitely read it and it's kind of fun to hear it from a female perspective. I know Jennifer Saint has written another one called Electra, which I will probably try out and see if that one's any better. I did like that <laughs> the, the myth that I'm familiar with, which is Ariadne and the Minotaur, that myth ends maybe a 25% into the book and then you have a whole 75% of the book where you're like, where are we going here? I don't know anything else about this because females are not spotlighted in Grecian myth unless they are having bad things happen to them or being generally like vengeful. <laughs> Bonus points for having female narration but negative points for not being very compelling or providing any additional agency for either female. Those were the books that I read in April and May and I have quite a few that I'm hoping to read this summer. I have two videos coming up soon featuring finally at long last my good friend Jay from my quarter life crisis. So those two videos will probably go up in the next two weeks. Yeah I hope you guys are having a great summer. Please like and subscribe to my channel if you enjoy and let me know if you've had any like summer reads that have really blown you away. Any disappointing reads that you held on to forever and you're sad you held on to them for as long as you did. Uh, drop a line in the comments below. I'd love to know. Remember to enjoy yourself, have a bit of a life, and I'll see you next time.